Hey class, uh, this is a lecture to kind of help tie in some loose ends with the last study sheet I gave you. Uh, now, the study sheet I'm giving you, the study sheet I gave you uh, deals with information from chapters 18 through 20. Uh, that goes from the Progressive Era through World War I uh, up until the 1920s. Now, the thing that's really noteworthy, and I talked about this in the last lecture, but the thing that's really noteworthy about the Progressive Era is that the Progressive Era was a time when things changed that allowed for uh, reforms that had not been possible uh, during the populist era. Uh, basically, you had a situation where you had a, a, a major uh, growth of immigrant populations in the United States. Uh, you had a major growth of, of urban populations. Uh, these urban populations got more voting power uh, in rural areas, especially in the West and the upper Midwest. <clears throat> there were reform movements that allowed uh, more power to people. Uh, and these, these took a number of different forms. Like for instance, in the West, it was in the Western states where women got the vote first. And also we begin to see reform movement uh, in, in the West. And like for instance, Wisconsin, becomes very uh, famous for uh, progressive politics. You know, people like Bob LaFollette. Uh, and these folks bring about a number of uh, major reform movements. Now, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, you know, you had people like the Muckrakers uh, who wrote books and who uh, published articles in newspapers uh, that made people aware of social problems. I mean, you know, the most famous Muckraker was... Uh, uh, the fellow who wrote the, the, the Jungle, the book about meatpacking in Chicago. And so therefore, there, there, was, there was a lot of interest in reforms. And so that's why you have reforms uh, like, you know, the various constitutional amendments that uh, brought about, uh, you know, the popular election of senators, uh, the development of income tax, um, uh, women voting, and also a prohibition. <clears throat> and so these were all changes that came about during, during this time uh, that were, you know, due to the, prog the progressive movement. And the thing about all these movements, they work towards um, having more democracy, you know, more people having more of a voice and uh, more people... Uh, and also, you know, just kind of making uh, things more fair. <clears throat> I mean, like, for instance, if we look, for instance, at the development of income tax, you know, prior to income tax, uh, the, the biggest way America, the federal government made money was off tariffs. Now, tariffs could not generate anywhere near as much money as income tax. And so, therefore, the, the federal government, by, by its nature, was much smaller. That meant that it did not have the wherewithal to regulate things that the modern government has. And so the progressive movement made a, made a big difference. Uh, the popular election of senators, as opposed to senators being elected by state legislatures, also was a major move for democracy, too. And so, you know, like I said, demographics, people moving into different places, uh, grassroots movements developing. All these things helped to bring about the, the progressive era. Now, there were limits to the progressive era. In particular, issues of race did not get much traction during the progressive era. I mean, one of the great ironies was that at the same time you had a progressive era, this was a period when lynchings were really at their height, you know, from the 1880s up until uh, about the end of World War I was a period when there were massive numbers of lynchings. And also these manifested themselves in what were usually known as riots, but quite often they were actually massacres. Now, I showed you guys, I, I assigned you guys film on a couple of these. Uh, you know, the one that happened in our local area was the East St. Louis riot in 1917, uh, which happened, you know, this is 1917, this is around about the time the United States uh, Uh, got involved in World War One, 
And in East St. Louis, as the film mentioned, you know, you, you had a lot of African Americans moving to East St. Louis. East St. Louis at that time was a uh, largely immigrant uh, community. Uh, African Americans at that time were, were Republicans because the Republican Party had been the party uh, that had ended slavery and had supported uh, black voting during Reconstruction. And so therefore, uh, as African Americans moved into uh, the North, uh, they were Republican voters. And so this caused friction uh, with white workers who were primarily Democrats. The Democratic Party uh, was, the, was the urban party in the North and supported workers. And so therefore there was a great deal of friction. And eventually, you know, rumors came about uh, that uh, black people were uh, involved in uh, vote rigging, uh, you know, voter fraud, you know, which is kind of interesting because, uh, you know, the voter fraud has always been uh, something that, that has been used in order to delegitimize the black vote over the years, you know, the accusation of voter fraud, although quite often uh, the evidence really isn't there. You know, like in the case of East St. Louis, there was a rumor that there was a train that would go from East St. Louis full of black people who would vote in East St. Louis, then go to Springfield, then go to Chicago and vote. Uh, you know, that would be a pretty big train. And, you know, that's that's a lot of movement in one day. I mean, even to this day, going, uh, you know, if you took hundreds of people from East St. Louis to Springfield to Chicago to vote in a day, uh, that doesn't seem too doable. I mean, I, I think that would be a tricky thing to do nowadays with automobiles and, you know, even airplanes. I, I could imagine that in 1917, that would have been a trickier thing to do. And of course, this eventually, and, and then in addition to the whole question of voting, there was the question of uh, job competition. Uh, unions at, at, at this time were segregated and uh, blacks often worked the scabs. In other words, the people who were hired uh, when there were, <coughs> when there were strikes. And so there was a great deal of friction between uh, black and white workers. And so eventually when you have the situation uh, where the car goes through the black community and shoots at folks, and then when another car looks like it goes through the community and black folks shoot back and they end up killing cops, then this becomes uh, uh, the situation that ticks off uh, the major riot in which, you know, we really to this day don't have an official number. I mean, you know, well, we do have an official number, but nobody really believes that's the real number. You know, officially, I think like 39 people, 39 blacks were killed, eight whites. Uh, but a lot of people think it was that the number of people actually killed was in the hundreds. <coughs> now, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you had a, a situation in which uh, a lot of blacks, you know, left the South. Now, Oklahoma is kind of an odd state because, you know, geographic Oklahoma's right next to Arkansas, right next to Texas, and culturally it's pretty Southern. But, uh, you know, Oklahoma up until 1911 had been Indian territory. And uh, so therefore it was not part of the Confederacy, even though culturally it was, it was a pretty Southern area. And so what we see is that a lot of black folks left uh, the South proper. You know, the Arkansas, Mississippi, those kind of places moved to Oklahoma. And especially in Tulsa, there was a very large black community that became very successful. Now, ultimately, and, and you know, it became so successful that it became known as Black Wall Street. Ultimately, uh, you know, there was frankly jealousy over a very successful black community. And what we see <coughs> is that in, in 1921, uh, at the height of this community's success, uh, there was a situation in which uh, a young white girl and, and, a, and, a, and a young black man were on the same elevator and uh, the girl accused the, the young man of touching her and, and you know, he, he was arrested, uh, attempted uh, rape. And, uh, you know, as was often the custom in America at that time, uh, that rumors started to develop pretty quickly that, he, that the young man was going to be lynched. Black men did not want to let that happen and uh, they organized against it. And what happens is that a big conflict breaks out between the white community and the black community. And the black community is destroyed. You know, all the black businesses are destroyed. Matter of fact, you know, new technology is used. I mean, uh, people with local airplanes actually bomb the black community. They go on airplanes and they drop dynamite on the, 
uh, on the community and, and blow them up. And so, you know, this is a this this is results in the destruction of Black Wall Street. Now, the interesting thing about it is that really for about 65, almost 70 years, nobody talked about Black Wall Street. Uh, you know, uh, the newspaper, the day of the riot, it published an editorial saying that sh there should be a lynching. Uh, but then after the after after it was over, I guess they were maybe ashamed that they did it, and they uh, pretty much buried that paper. And so for a very long time, you know, people almost forgot that the Tulsa riots happened. But you know, recently, it, it, you know, people have acknowledged it, and you know, next year will be a hundred years since it happened. Now the other situation that I talked about, I gave you all a film about, was in Elaine, Arkansas. This happened in 1919. And this was a situation in which uh, you had men coming back from World War I uh, and who wanted uh, to get a better deal of sharecroppers. You know, as, as we talked about in the very first test, you know, sharecropping was a situation where uh, black workers uh, did not get a, a, a fair break in, you know, in farming. And so these guys want to start a union. So what we see is that in Phillips County, Arkansas, which is in eastern Arkansas, which actually is where my wife uh, was born and grew up, it's, on, it's in eastern Arkansas right on the border with, with Mississippi. Um, these uh, sharecroppers began to organize, and as the film showed, uh, you know, Local farmers heard about it and tried to bust up the meeting, and there was a gunfire. And so, ultimately, uh, there was a mass movement of, uh, of 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 white supporters of of the farmers who came, you know, throughout Arkansas from Mississippi and other places, to shut down uh, the farmers. Now, the significant thing is that uh, a number of these farmers were arrested and charged with murder. Now, this is where it gets interesting because, uh, you know, to go back uh, several years earlier, a civil rights organization, the NAACP, is formed. And uh, the NAACP uh, was formed by black activists like W.B. Du Bois, uh, you know, Ida B. Wells that you all read about earlier, who was the anti-lynching activist, and a number of other people, uh, Ben. Uh, Trotter, a number of other folks who were involved. And also, a lot of whites were involved, too. I mean, a lot of people may not realize it, but the NAACP, you know, about the first five or six presidents of the NAACP, up until about almost 1930, were all white. And, and so, therefore, although it was the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, uh, it had white and black members, and, and the leadership was integrated. But anyway, what the NAACP ended up doing very early on is that it developed a strategy of using the court system to try to get justice. Now, this made sense because at this time, blacks couldn't vote in the South. And uh, they had, you know, black people had very limited uh, political influence. But they could uh, get lawyers and they could go to court and they could sue. And so what we see is that uh, the Elaine, Arkansas uh, situation, and you know, like the film I show you talked about, Africanus Horton, uh, you know, the local black lawyer who uh, really worked uh, to, to free the men in Elaine, <clears throat> the 13 men in Elaine who had been sentenced to death. Uh, they were able to appeal through the federal court and eventually get these men released. And so this is very significant because this was really the first time the federal government ever really uh, Found a case, you know, really found a case in favor of, of, of a black plaintiff. And uh, it really had a major impact on uh, American history. I mean, right now, if you look at, you know, the controversy that's gone on over President Trump's appointment of Amy Coney Barrett to the, to the Supreme Court, I mean, that really goes all the way back to the Elaine, Arkansas case 101 years ago. Because the NAACP, you know, from 1919 to 1954, when they would eventually have Brown versus the Board of Education, which outlawed segregation, uh, they, can, they use the legal system to chip away at uh, discrimination against black people. And so what we see is that 
the NAACP proved that uh, the courts could be used to achieve political ends. And, you know, a lot of uh, conservatives looked at this as, you know, what they referred to as judicial activism, you know, using uh, judges to achieve legislative ends. And so really, that's probably why for the last, you know, 30 years or so, it's really been a big objective of conservatives to put in conservative judges, you know, to really kind of counteract uh, the the use of the courts by liberals that developed uh, 101, 101 years ago with Elaine, Arkansas. So, you know, really that's why that's such an important case. Now, moving on from that, uh, I want to talk a bit about economics. Now, the United States came out of World War I in pretty good shape. Uh, you know, America was the one major power that didn't get beat up or uh, they didn't suffer, you know, military damage during the war. Uh, well, now, Britain really didn't get much damage in, the, in, in World War I either because the war was fought in Europe. But uh, America really was in good shape. Uh, you know, not only did America not get much military damage, much, not much damage to its territory, America also lost a, a much smaller proportion of its uh, population in the war than the countries in Europe. I mean, Britain, for instance, lost almost a million soldiers. America lost 160,000. Now, 160,000 of a lot of dead soldiers. But when you consider that World War I overall had almost 11 million people die, losing 160,000 is a pretty small number. You know, even though that still is an unfathomable tragedy. But, you know, in the context of a war where almost 11 million people died, that's not very big. And so America came out of World War I in very good shape. And what we see, uh, you know, you go on to, uh, to uh, chapter 20, is that in America, new technology really made a big difference. Uh, you had... Uh, for instance, vacuum cleaners, uh, washing machines, uh, you know, automobiles had already been around, but they were becoming even more common, uh, record players. And really, the really biggest new technology was the radio. And so what we see is that in the 1920s, you're really starting to see the development of America's consumer economy. Uh, you know, once you get into the 20th century, you have, you know, the American economy moves in such a way that it really is dominated by people buying stuff. And not just necessities. I mean, like, for instance, in the 19th century, uh, you know, especially when a lot of people were ruled, people didn't buy that much. You know, they would buy some cloth and sew their own clothes. Uh, you know, they would get uh, utensils they needed or tools. Uh, they would buy seed they needed, you know, if they couldn't save seed themselves. But people were, were, were expected to be self-sufficient. But by the time you get into the 20th century, you know, with trains, uh, with the development of much more effective communications and travel, and with increased industrial capacity, uh, you begin to see people buying stuff as opposed to making stuff. And so you see a lot more production of consumer goods. And so the American economy begins to run on consumer goods. And so what we see is that the 1920s becomes a period of the Roaring Twenties. You know, people in city areas in particular do very well. There's a lot of stuff being made. People are doing well. Now, the thing to realize is that people outside of the cities are not necessarily doing so well. I mean, farmers find themselves at a great disadvantage because what happens is that as um, farming technology develops, as you have uh, more machinery, farmers are able to produce more. And really one of the great ironies is that as you have more production, This means that uh, prices for farm goods go down. 
And so although people in the cities benefit from this by having much cheaper food, the people who produce the food have less and less and less money. And uh, so what we see is that rural folks, uh, you know, whether they're farmers or whether they're the people uh, who uh, work on farming, like say sharecroppers, they are all doing worse and worse and worse. Now, the other thing that's really significant, too, and this goes back to the movie I showed you guys about the Bonus Army, is that men who were drafted into the Army ended up doing much worse than uh, men who weren't drafted and who were allowed to keep working in the civilian sector. <clears throat> and so what we see is that when World War II ends, excuse me, when World War I ends, these guys come back home and... Financially, they're behind the curve relative to uh, people who stayed home and worked. Now, what we see is that ultimately all these things kind of come together to really blow things up because the United States, like all other countries, had a very nationalist economic policies. And this would eventually result in what becomes known as the Smoot-Hawley Tariff, which was a tariff that was passed in the 1920s that was very protectionist. Uh, and it, it, was, it was designed to, uh, you know, really limit the impact of, uh, you know, really limit the ability of, of foreigners to uh, import things into the United States. Now, the significant thing is that countries in Europe uh, did the same thing. So what we end up with is a situation where uh, trade, international trade contracts because nobody wants to let anybody else's goods into their country. And so as a result, by the time you get to the end of the 1920s, uh, you are seeing a major contraction in trade. Now, in addition to this contraction in trade, you also have a situation in which uh, you have people who overinvest in the stock market. And stock markets are also not regulated. You have a situation where banks, for instance, uh, are selling uh, stocks and, they, and they're, well, they, well, they actually are taking their bank account money and they're buying stocks with it. Now, this, of course, is dangerous because, you know, as long as the stocks are making money, you do all right. But once the stock market collapses, as it, do, as it does in 1929, this money disappears. Now, I gave you all the wrong date on Smooth Holly. It's 1930. And so this is after Ho Ho Herbert Hoover is president. And like I say, the, the, America's already in depression, but rather than trying to have free trade, they restrict trade. And uh, this makes the country's e economy shrink even more. And, you know, really that's why, you know, for the last uh, 87 years, you know, for 87 years from 1930 until really until President Trump comes in in, in 2017, the federal government tends not to put too much emphasis on tariffs because people go back to the time of the Great Depression and say, you know, look, excessive tariffs ends up in the restriction of trade and ends up in uh, constricting the economy. It makes the economy shrink. And, you know, one could argue that, you know, that's happened, you know, in the last three years. Now, I don't want to get too much into current politics because, uh, you know, that tends to be a touchy area. But I'm just saying from a historical standpoint, that's why, you know, for almost 90 years, folks didn't do a whole lot of tariffs because it was seen as something that could undermine uh, in national economy. I mean, you might be able to protect uh, maybe your factory, but when somebody else puts a tariff on you, then maybe they hurt your farmers or they hurt your aerospace industry. And so tariffs have a way of ultimately shrinking the economy. And so that's the significance of the smooth holly tariff. Now, ultimately... What we see under Herbert Hoover, and this goes back to the Bonus Army film, 
is that as the depression kicks in, the government at this time, you know, does not believe in having assistance to people when the government goes bad. They rely on charity, which is really kind of ironic because Herbert Hoover himself had actually become famous for helping people uh, who were in need in Europe after World War after World War I. But in America, he says, you know, look, the this is not the role of government. It should be charity. And, and But the problem of that, of course, is, you know, when you have a situation where as much as one-third of the economy, is where as much as one-third of the workforce is out of jobs, I mean, that's just really a huge amount uh, to expect a, a, the a private, you know, private charity to take care of. And so ultimately, you see all of these veterans coming to Washington, D.C. in 1932 as the Bonus Army. And of course, for those of y'all who watched the film, you know, the government ends up attacking uh, these uh, people. And this really hurts Her Herbert Hoover. And it's one of the major factors that results in him losing the election of 1932. And eventually we see uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt come into power. Well, anyway, class, um, that's going to be uh, this that for this lecture. Now, I didn't talk very much about Woodrow Wilson. I talked about that a little bit in the last film, and also the film I gave you on the Peacemakers is pretty straightforward. Of that, if you choose to answer that question, you should be able to get the information you need there. Well, anyway, class, that's going to be about it for this.